we're at uh, 270 degrees already and I don't know how close that thermistor is to actually touching I'm going to be careful so it doesn't melt through and touch it 350 degrees 380, 400 so it is like an oven in this video we're going to be talking about why you might want to consider using a torque screwdriver uh, a lot of guys don't use torque screwdrivers and actually it's the majority the majority of guys don't use torque screwdrivers and I actually did a poll a while back and I'll overlay that here on the screen uh, but the vast majority usually don't use them but situations like this potentially could be avoided uh, by using one what can happen with a loose connection is you may run into a situation where it could overheat and cause the insulation on the conductor to fail and so we're going to be uh, diagnosing this particular breaker here which has that exact scenario this breaker right down here is for an electric water heater and we did all the troubleshooting steps for the water heater but it was still tripping the breaker after about 10 minutes and after opening it up and inspecting it there's a burnt wire on this breaker that was causing everything to overheat to the point where the breaker was tripping so we're going to go through and replace the breaker and use our torque screwdriver to basically fix this problem what we're going to do first is take our clamp meter and put it in amps alternating current mode and then we're going to clamp it around one of the two wires that are going to our double pole breaker all right we're going to go ahead and turn that breaker on now and we'll see what kind of amperage we're drawing I'm expecting it to draw around 18 amps, which would be that 4,400 watts is the rating of most electrical elements for a 240 volt water heater. So that is not overloaded whatsoever at this point. Uh, this would be the correct amount of current going to the elements for this water heater. So now we're just going to observe and let it run and see what happens with the wire connected to this breaker and I'll continue to monitor the amperage and we'll see if this thing is kicking out because of amperage or because of heat because that's the two different ways that a breaker will trip the first way is the most common and that is for the breaker to simply have too much current being drawn from it the second way is for uh, the breaker to physically overheat to where it will then kick out automatically obviously you can tell that there's been a significant amount of heat on this wire since the insulation has completely melted off so I don't know if the, the heat from that is causing it to trip or if it's actual amperage. So we will monitor it and see what happens. We are going to be replacing this breaker. So we're going to go ahead and remove this metal piece. And for those of you that are wondering, this is a lockout uh, bracket or whatever you want to call it that allows you to turn off the breaker and put something through here to prevent it from being uh, turned on. Presumably you would use some kind of a padlock device or a lockout device. I'll link in the description under the video to these things, but you really want these in scenarios where um, you're not in the same room as the piece of equipment that the breaker is powering. And if there's no other disconnect next to the water heater, for example, then a lockout is going to make sure that it doesn't accidentally get turned on. The way this thing is installed is this little arm right here is bent into position so that it can't be removed. So we're just going to do the opposite process and we'll, we'll try to install it on the new breaker. Like that. So you just tweak it slightly and then it, it comes loose. So we'll set that off to the, the side and then install it on the new breaker in a minute. We're a few minutes in and we're still drawing that 18.4 amps so still as expected in regards to that. Uh, the wire doesn't appear to be heating up visually so it's not like glowing or anything like that. What I'm going to do is grab a temperature probe and connect that to my multimeter here and we'll just see what the temperature of that wire is reading. I got my shotgun mic so hopefully you guys can hear this but the breaker is making an internal arcing sound. I think it's internal but it could be on the actual connection. But just listen to this. So you can definitely tell something is happening. I'm kind of leaning towards bad breaker, uh, but the most common thing that causes these wires to get burned like this, uh, right on the breaker like that, is for it to be a loose connection. And we're going to check how tight that screw is here in a couple minutes, just to see if it wasn't 
quite torqued down enough. I'm going to switch to a macro lens and we're going to try to get a close up of this uh, terminal right here as it is slowly heating up. All right, well here's our macro lens. I think this is about as close as I can get. I'm going to clear the cobwebs out of the way. We're still drawing 18.5 amps, so nothing has changed on the amount of electricity we're drawing, which indicates that the wire and the water heater appear to be working as they should. This right here is our temperature probe. I went ahead and insulated it with a little bit of electrical tape so we don't make an electrical connection to our wire, but I'm just going to try to kind of stick it in here between these two cables so we can get a reading on what that wire is heating up to. It is definitely getting hot. It's actually melting the electrical tape. We're at uh, 270 degrees already and I don't know how close that thermistor is to actually touching. I'm going to be careful so it doesn't melt through and touch it. 350 degrees, 380, 400, so it is like an oven. Still drawing 18 amps. There it went. So the, the body of the breaker itself actually feels pretty warm. It's not hot, I wouldn't say, but uh, it's still kind of hard to say whether or not this was related to the connection on the edge of the breaker or if it was related to the internals of the breaker. So maybe we'll open this thing up and kind of look inside of it later on. What we're going to do now is turn the power off to the entire panel and uh, we're going to take this breaker out and I'm going to try to remove this wire by just uh, wiggling it back and forth. We're actually not going to loosen the connection just to see if that connection was actually loose. So in this case our main breaker is this one right here. This is a pretty old panel as you can see but same concepts still apply. Alright, and the power is off now. Uh, technically you could get away without turning the power off, but turning it off is just an extra level of safety. Also wearing gloves is a good idea, which I am not for some reason. Alright, now we can get a close-up view of our connections here. I finally got some gloves on. Uh, sorry, I didn't wear them earlier. Now we'll have to see what the actual cause of this failure was, whether or not it's a loose connection or something internal with the breaker. Uh, my honest guess is that this was related to the connection. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and take this and just see if it's going to come out for us without having to loosen anything. And yeah, it just pulled right out without having to really try at all. Uh, the easy way that this can kind of happen accidentally is that these stranded wires, when you first tighten them down, they kind of all push up against each other and it might feel tight at first, but what you need to do in order for this to properly tighten down is to wiggle the wires back and forth after you've tightened it and then tighten it again and do that several times to make sure that it's actually torqued down and that it's not going to come loose again. We'll tear this breaker down and take a look inside to see if uh, there are any issues uh, inside of the breaker but my guess is it's exclusively from this terminal. Once you've had a wire that is overheated like this on a terminal, it's best practice to replace the breaker because it can actually affect the screw and the basically the hardness of the metal of that little plate and the screw that pushes down on it uh, can be changed by the fact that there was a super hot uh, conductor underneath. So we're gonna disconnect this and get our new breaker installed. That one actually didn't feel super tight either, but there they are. Now obviously we're going to strip this uh, cable back so that we are back to the undamaged insulation. Well that still got hot enough that it was, the insulation was kind of well into it. I'm going to trim it back a little bit further. I'm 
This is a good example of why you want to leave a little bit of extra wire in your panel. Uh, you never know when you're going to need that extra three inches or whatever in order to redo a connection or move a breaker or whatever. Now we've got a new tool at our disposal and that is a WIA torque screwdriver. I will link to this one in the description. These things are not cheap. I think there are cheaper options out there. I will link the different ones in the description. But this is going to allow us to properly set the torque on our new breaker connections, which is something that most electricians don't do, uh, but is probably good practice uh, and something that is becoming more common as time goes on. These are the items that come with the screwdriver. And if you look closely at the end, you'll see that we have our marking on the number of inch pounds that is, it is currently set to. And you can see that the range is 10 to 50 inch pounds. Now, in order to adjust this, we actually have a, a tool that's dedicated for that, and it's this screwdriver looking thing that we actually put into the screwdriver, and that's gonna allow us to actually change the torque settings. So we need to set this to the number of inch pounds that we need. So we need to take a quick look at our breaker and see what that is. Right here is our new breaker, and if you look on the side, you should be able to find the specifications for the torque settings. Right underneath the sizing information for the types of wire that can be connected, you'll see right there it says 36 pound inches, so or inch pounds, and that's what we're gonna set our torque screwdriver to now. One thing that's kind of interesting that I noticed is I don't really see any torque settings listed on the original breaker, so this is definitely something that has been a more recent thing to where they are now requiring uh, each terminal basically to have a, wait, let's see, let's look at this sticker here. So I don't think there is any torque information on this original breaker. So uh, kind of interesting how they have added that additional specificity to the new breakers that are when they're installed. Now that we know the torque setting we're after, we can go ahead and adjust this to the 36 inch pounds. the sound of my electrical tester turning off automatically. 34 and there's 36 inch pounds. So we've got our correct setting now. We're ready to tighten these connections in place. Once we have the correct torque setting uh, for our screwdriver we take this uh, piece here and stick that into the screwdriver and then we attach whatever bit we want to use. So in this case I'm using this one that I just dropped on the floor. In this case we're using these... No. You've got to be kidding me. Germans. Man. So apparently this isn't standard uh, quarter inch right here, which is absurd. <laughs> I shouldn't be allowed. So I gotta figure out how I can get something attached to here. But this is the connection thing. You'd think that it would just be standard quarter inch, but it's uh, definitely smaller than that. So I'll come back when I find the right thing here. So apparently a $150 screwdriver does not come with the tips. So these tips I guess are sold separately or they were missing from my package. So I don't know which it is. I'm gonna have to see what my options are here for figuring something out to make it work for now. Man, I can't believe I did that. We gotta go, we'll, we'll get it going. We'll get some uh, proper bits coming. But right now, in our, in the, for the sake of making the video work, Joe's gonna save the video, so. <laughs> Alright, see if it see if it'll fit on there. So we were able to make this uh, bit speak German with a little bit of persuasion from the grinder. So we now have a bit that goes in here, but apparently there's a bunch of uh, proper Weeha bits that we're supposed to be using. So maybe we'll order some of those. Um, but for now, this works. Now I've got this thing set back to 10 inch pounds again, uh, just because I was kind of experimenting with how it works. And basically it's the same as those gas caps where you tighten the gas cap and then it kind of clicks and allows it to basically release. And it's the same thing with this. So if I tighten this, you'll hear that it clicks and the handle continues to rotate around. So I can't accidentally over torque it. 
So this is what I was talking about with the gas cap. Basically, the way these things are designed is they don't want you to make this thing be too tight. So instead of letting it just be a standard cap where you could theoretically tighten it farther than you could, this you tighten until it clicks. And that click is basically the sound of the torque value being set by the gas cap itself. Just like that. So that's a set torque value, probably about, how many inch pounds do you think that is? Oh, that's pretty harsh. But it prevents uh, people from tightening it too much, isn't it? Like interesting? 15? So I bet it's, uh, I bet it's, a lot more. I bet yeah, it's I 40, 45, uh, 45 inch pounds would be my guess. <laughs> But nobody will ever know, yeah. so <laughs> doesn't really matter. We're not testing it. This isn't Project Farm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we'll change the torque setting back to the 36 inch pounds that we're supposed to have by pulling that out like that, inserting our adjustment tool, and then we'll crank it down until we get to 36, 34, 36. So that's to the right torque setting now again. Now I'll just show you again. It sounds a little bit different when it's at a higher torque value. It's a little bit louder click. So we'll go ahead and tighten this. And you can hear how it's a nice loud snap because it's a higher torque setting. So the screwdriver is ready to go. We can torque our connections here in just a second. Now I like to connect uh, the wires to the breaker before I install it a lot of the time and that's what we're gonna do now. I'll put my gloves back on again. I'm not using my torque screwdriver for anything other than actually torquing the connection. So with initially getting it started, I'm just going to use my regular insulated screwdriver. So we've got our first wire just kind of snugged up here a little bit. We're going to go ahead and connect our, our second one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten this down as much as I kind of would think it would need to be tightened down. And then we'll come back and torque it after the fact and see if it was tight enough or over tightened or what. Um, but Typically, I just tighten it down until it kind of gets real stiff, obviously. And then you take the wires and you move them back and forth like this, since it's stranded wires. And that will kind of cause them to kind of spread out a little bit and uh, allow you to tighten it down a little bit extra here. So, right about there, is about where I would stop. Now this bottom one, like I said, we've just got it snugged up here a little bit, so we'll get our torque screwdriver now. Right here, 36 inch pounds it's set to with our modified bit adapter. And we'll go ahead and crank that down here. There it is. All right, that is pretty stiff actually. All right, let's do the top one now. This is the one that I would have deemed to be tight enough already, so we'll see. The screw definitely moved. So it was, it definitely did tighten it a little bit more than uh, I would have tightened it normally, but it was pretty close. I just wiggled the wires. Oh. Modified bit adapter problems here. And one more time the top one. All right, those are as good as they're gonna get. So we're ready to snap this back in position. So technically, um, there should be a plug in the back of this panel right here where there's a hole where there was an opening made but not used. Uh, obviously, it's beneficial to have metal in between the inside of your panel and the outside of your panel, and this is actually a pretty good instance of it because um, this wire right here was uh, burned off. This thing was to the point where it could almost start something on fire and it was only a matter of inches away from that bare wood there. So just kind of interesting to notice that. That's something that will uh, likely work towards fixing. But for now we're going to snap this breaker back in and uh, test it out make sure everything looks good. All right, we'll go ahead and turn our power back onto the building here. And then we'll go ahead and take an amp reading of this breaker once we turn it on. 
Now we'll go ahead and turn the breaker on to our water heater. And I will test the voltage here too. I didn't test the voltage earlier, but I'm not really concerned about that at all. And then we're drawing our proper uh, amperage. And we'll monitor this to make sure that nothing seems like it's heating up uh, as we are finishing up here. But let's go ahead and take a quick voltage reading just to see that that is correct. You can see, huh, can you see? There, now you can see. See right there, we're running at 242 volts, so that is perfectly fine. Nothing out of tolerance there whatsoever. We'll just monitor the temperature of the breaker here briefly, but I'm 99% sure we are good to go. Let's go ahead and install our lockout bracket again. That just slides in right there on the bottom of the breaker. And then we simply take our screwdriver and tilt the top edge in, just like so. Pretty smart design. In new installations, uh, if you are doing this in a residential setting, uh, you may need to install a GFCI breaker. If you're so, like, if you're putting in a new water heater, uh, you need to put in a double pole. GFCI breaker. Uh, it's a fairly recent change, I believe, as the 2020 National Electrical Code. So just keep that in mind if you are doing a new build. Or if the authority having jurisdiction would like you to replace it with a GFCI breaker, you should do so. Here we are in the shop. Uh, we're going to attempt to take this apart and see if there's anything weird internally going on with it. Uh, there's a few rivet-ish things it looks like here on this side. We're just going to try drilling these rivets out for now and see if it will just kind of come open from one end. I have not moved this screw since we pulled that wire out. And what I'm curious about is if this thing is fully seated right now or not. Sometimes, if a breaker had been previously installed uh, to where the, the screw was over-tightened, it can permanently deform that jaw underneath. Uh, I don't think that that's the case. That looks like that's pretty flat and that there's room to tighten it still. Let's just see here. Yeah, and you can see that this actually wasn't all the way tight. So I think that this really was an issue of it not being tight enough. But let's get this thing opened up. That sound that we heard earlier of the like breaker, that buzzing sound, did kind of sound like it was coming from inside the breaker. So right now the breaker is turned off and those contacts are separate. Now if I turn it back on, you can see it quickly shuts that contact right there. You can see how the contact points don't look particularly amazing. So I don't know that the sound was necessarily coming from right here or if it was coming from uh, where it actually connects to the uh, terminal. But the in other interesting thing is uh, this little piece right here is where this actually grabs on to the point where it gets power from the panel. So when you turn the breaker off, so now it's on, when you turn it off, it actually the entire inside of the breaker is de-energized. It's not just like the contact point over here, it's all the way from this point back. After taking the breaker apart and looking at each of its individual parts, it was really interesting kind of noticing a few different things. I think this was tripping for two different reasons. The first reason is that loose connection that we all observed, and that was definitely creating extra heat that was being applied to this terminal right here and transferring that heat up into the breaker. Now, the second uh, thing that I noticed is that this contact right here in particular is discolored significantly compared to this one. You can see how this is kind of a nice shiny 
uh, gold color and this one definitely has been pretty hot. So I think that the uh, connection right here between this face and on the edge of the actual breaker, right here where this contact point is located, right down in there, was heating up significantly. You can see even on the body of the breaker inside, it was getting pretty hot. So I don't think this was exclusively due to the loose connection. I think it was a combination of this connection in here, as well as the connection that was being made to the actual circuit wiring. Now as far as I can tell, right here is the bimetal strip. Bimetal strip means that this piece right here where my finger is touching is made out of two different types of metals and as the temperature changes this actually flexes back and forth just a tiny little bit and what that does is it interacts with this trigger component right over here. This was positioned something like this to where when that thing would heat up it would basically push over and cause this thing to lose grip and fall down and that caused the breaker to trip. I'm sure I'm oversimplifying it but that's the general concept of what was going on. So anyway, just kind of interesting seeing the inside of a breaker. I wasn't able to get it to trip using heat. I tried using a soldering iron as well as a little electric heater to see if I could just make it trip by overheating it. But I think I needed a lot more heat or maybe you actually need current flowing through the breaker at the same time. Anyway, just kind of interesting to see the different components. Here's a little uh, Visi trip window. That's, I think that's how uh, Square D QO has branded it and this interacts with this little piece right here and when it is tripped this would go in front of the window and you'd be able to see that and when it wasn't tripped it was like that so just kind of an interesting component to look at there but you can definitely tell that that uh, contact point on the left there was uh, significantly warmer than the one on the right and uh, then obviously where the connection was made to the actual circuit wiring that also was very very hot I think it was the same one that was hot on both sides. Uh, but anyway, definitely caused it to trip at a, a normal uh, amount of current, so the breaker definitely was bad. So in combination of the bad contact point inside of the breaker and the connection to the building wiring, uh, between those two things, that's what put the end to this particular breaker. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found that to be interesting. Have you guys ran into this situation with burned terminals like this before or burned wires? Uh, and what was the cause most of the time? Is it because of a loose connection usually or is it because of a, a failed device? Uh, my guess personally is that it's usually because of an improperly torqued connection that makes this happen. Uh, but it can be the equipment itself causing the failure as well. I'll put a couple of related videos here on the screen for you guys to choose from, so if you click on one of those, we can continue troubleshooting something super exciting. Uh, no cats or dusty projects, meat in storage. Meat is in storage. Oh my! <laughs> that is highly disturbing to the average person. Don't worry, it's okay, we're just uh, processing some beef here. 